<clears throat> okay, hello. Uh, uh, today um, uh, we'll talk about two architects. One extremely well known, but deserving, deservedly uh, Louis Kahn, and the other one less well known, but in my opinion, a remarkable architect. We'll begin with Giuseppe Perugini, uh, and uh, then we'll, we'll talk about Louis Kahn. Giuseppe Perugini was born on, on this day. Uh, uh, in 1914, uh, and uh, Louis Kahn died on the 17th of March, uh, 1974. Let's read a little bit about Perugini. Uh, Giuseppe Perugini arrived in Rome in the early 30s. He came from Argentina. So he was born in Argentina and arrived in Rome in the early 30s and enrolled in the Faculty of Architecture. After graduating in 1941, uh, he began an intense teaching and research activity at the Faculty of Architecture as a professor of architectural composition. A further demonstration of his desire to experiment is the fact that he was among the first scholars, interestingly, he is called a scholar, to propose in the 1960s the use of computers as instrument authorizing modular elements. 1960s, wow. To this day, he, uh, to this end, he presented a series of projects to international competitions, such as the circular bridge over the Strait of Messina, the Plateau Bobur Tower Helix, born from the integration of particularly expressive science and avant-garde technological choices, and others such as the well-known cybernetic hospital or the UNIDO headquarters in Vienna, where the function is privileged through the decomposition and the recomposition of cells aggregated electronically according to the actual needs, thus eliminating the conventional dispersions of the traditional architectural object. But the truth of the matter is, um, it is extremely difficult, or for me, it was extremely difficult to find images of his work with the exception of the so-called experimental house. So I will only show two works by him, but they are both very engaging and very, very interesting. The only picture I found of him is this one, low resolution, and I regret, but at least we have a little bit, uh, uh, a small picture with him working on some kind of a skyscraper, I guess. And now I read also his first work, the Monumento, Mon the Monument to the Fosse Arge Ardeatine in Rome. I don't know what this is, and I don't even know if I read quite correctly. At the same time, architectural structure, symbol, and memorial appears as a unique tomb, collective tomb, while the buildings of the judicial city were configured as a true citadel inspired by the urban aspect of the justice of the classical age. I couldn't find any image of this judicial city. Also belonging to the same ideology are the church, sacrarium, uh, Pied Piedimonte, Sari Germano, for this one also, I couldn't find any image. The aforementioned bridge of Messina, the kinetic explosion of the project of an exhibition pole in the Fortezza da Basso in Florence, the binomial matter music of the Memorial Fermi Prism in Chicago. They all sound interesting. It's possible he worked either with the name of his firm, which was not, you know, uh, which was not his name. Maybe this explains why I couldn't find uh, uh, images or even information about his work. But let's look at this experimental house, which attracted my, my attention in the first place. It's called also Casa Albero, and it was uh, vandalized, abandoned. And now I read that it, uh, it is beginning to be uh, reborn, so to speak. Finally, the order of architects of Italy is beginning to consider to restore it. And I'm glad to hear this because it is a remarkable house. So Casa Sperimentale a Pregene Roma, I guess near Roma, 1969. It's truly really a remarkable building. I mean, uh, 
you know, when I first saw it, I, 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 I was, um, you know, astonished. And e even if it is, uh, yes, uh, affected by the elements and neglect, it's still a very interesting house. Uh, and uh, again, sorry, you know, I have uh, quite a number of pictures with this building, some better, some less, less good, but, um, you know, experiment in architecture and not just in architecture is a good thing, you know, because it keeps architecture moving. It, you keep exploring things that were not done. And uh, this to me is a, is a big yes to life. You know, you feel encouraged to have hope because of this uh, new beginning that an experiment means. There are interesting things here, structurally speaking. Look how he supports the bottom of the part of the building above. There, are, there is the column, there is the beam, then there are additional beams um, the perpendicular on the, on the main beam, and then a transitional element painted in red, maybe that's what he intended, uh, supporting the bottom uh, of, or maybe the, the center of a maybe a prefabricated concrete element. Uh, but, you know, this, this, is, uh, this shows uh, sophistication. It's a straightforward architecture, but not a simplistic architecture. Uh, and just here, you know, we see interesting things that, that are rather unique. Um, I mean, if this building is taken care of, it, it, it could be a remarkable, uh, a remarkable building. And even like this is a remarkable building. I don't know what's going on in this, uh, well, not quite spherical. I, you'll see a, a, a plan of the building, but, um, you know, still curved and uh, interesting uh, additions to the house, which is otherwise kind of uh, Cartesian, but but if you see, if you look at the plan, you realize that there is a something uh, kind of organic, although it's it's based on 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 uh, you know straight lines and and, and the ninety degrees angles. But then he has these uh, Hieronymus Bosch uh, interventions, you know, these uh, these curved things which are surreal almost, you know, and uh, even this thing, you know, the diagonal in red. Um, yes, it is with graffiti on it, but you see when the conception is generous, and in this case it is, the graffiti cannot subtract from the, you know, the nobility of, 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 of this conception. So uh, in some cases, maybe the, the, the graffiti even add something, maybe. I'm not sure I'm right about this, but uh, I, I said maybe. It's an interesting, a unique building. It really is, and it's done by this architect who I read in some on, on some other site that he, he came to Italy from Argentina in order to study sculpture, and uh, I think he suffered an accident, which made him, um, you know, uh, he became uh, handicapped for doing sculpture, so he decided to study architecture. But his interest in sculpture is shown, I think, even in his work uh, as an architect. It is without doubt a very original um, uh, building, a very original house. I think no one would, uh, would uh, you know, dispute this. Uh, the interior also, you know, I mean, look at it. This is an abandoned, vandalized uh, building, if I am to call it so vandalized, but uh, it's still interesting, you know, with all these uh, ad hoc uh, graphic interventions on the walls. Right now, the building is on maybe whoever, someone from his family having the same name, Perugini. Um, and it is him who is pushing now towards restoring the building. Everything is, is uh, unique and creative, you know, and uh, you know, 
uh, when there is a vision, when there is a fresh, uh, uh, you know, idea behind the work, that that work uh, somehow endures, even when it is, uh, yes, uh, uh, you know, uh, abandoned or or, or, uh, or uh, vandalized. But you see, this is not the only work he did. And uh, I read he did some other works, only one other project I, I was able to find for this presentation. But that one is equal, uh, equally remarkable and uh, very different from this one. I really like his idea here, you know, of, uh, you know, uh, supporting structurally in this way these uh, concrete uh, cubicles The playfulness <clears throat> within which, you know, the, the playfulness with which he, he um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, creates the, the openings in the walls, you know, it's the, the, the windows are very playfully placed. And I like the fragmentation, you know, there are little squares, larger squares, and uh, not only squares. There is a, there is a joie de vivre here, I would say, a, a joy of of and, and this is a, this is a view. It almost looks like it is upside down because this this thing he he does from the bottom, but now I am a little bit confused. Yes, this, if this is the, the bottom of the column, then it's an interesting uh, intermediate uh, part that uh, translates, uh, that uh, yes, uh, creates this uh, meeting between the vertical and the horizontal plane. I, I never saw some, something like this before. And this, it seems so uh, almost natural and simple, but I, 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 I never saw something like this. There is a rotation also in on his um, uh, tomb uh, stone or gravestone. You are going to see it. So I think he, he was a playful spirit. And even in the afterlife, he continued to play. Well, you know, at the, on the threshold between the two lives. This is uh, an elevation of the building. I don't know what's going on in this. Maybe some kind of, uh, you know, small spaces for uh, a soliloquy or, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know, but they are interesting. They almost look like, uh, you know, some kind of shields. Casa Sperimentale. Uh, here, sorry for the resolution. I told you I had difficulties to find um, the images, but you can still see the plan. It's uh, it's um, it's based on on uh, you know right uh, right uh, you know on on um, straight lines and uh, ninety degrees angle, but not only. And uh, it's not dogmatic. There is freedom. This is a, a drawing done recently, you know, with the purpose of uh, restoring the building. Uh, because it is, you know, maybe this building is uh, seductive because it kind of uses two systems, you know, the rational system and the irrational. I hesitate to use the word system because in the case of Unreason, maybe the word the system is not uh, is not the, the appropriate one, but uh, 
uh, you know, uh, even Hamlet, if he was mad, he had a system. Even then, when he said, I am mad, mad, north, northwest. The rebirth of Ca Casa Albero, I, I, I already mentioned that it is in the process of, uh, of, uh, of being restored. So 25 years have passed since the death of architect Perugini and his Casa Sperimentale is still being talked about, deservedly so. It has deservedly returned to the public spotlight thanks to an exhibition at the Weissenhof Gallery in Stuttgart, where there is that uh, famous uh, architecture colony, and the establishment in Rome of a committee tasked with its protection. The Comitato Permanente per la Tutela della Casa Albero uh, has already cleaned the pala and other, other sections in the main structure of the graffiti that has built up over, over the years of neglect. The new organization's intention espoused by the current owner, architect Reinaldo Perugini. I found more pictures with uh, uh, Reinaldo Perugini. Maybe they were, I don't know, brothers or his, his son, or I don't know, but I couldn't find with the, with the creator of the house. Anyway, is that Casa Albero should become a public space, a cultural center that can host initiatives and events aimed at enhancing its educational and cultural potential. This signals a return to its origins for Perugini's work with its intrinsically experimental and open nature in a reversal of the degradation and neglect that we are unfortunately used to seeing in Italy. And it's true, they leave even buildings by Palladio uh, neglected and degraded, but then they are so rich Almost every building in Italy is a masterpiece. I'm, I'm exaggerating, of course, but they, ha they do have a lot. <laughs> and, uh, but with this, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, legitimize, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, neglecting them. Our small initiative, whoever wrote this, undertaken with open hearts and lights, is intended to help spread the word about an important but little known architectural work and about the passion that drives the volunteers of the committee for its rediscovery and reassessment. Now, why was light mentioned? Because this, or lights, because this text was written by some kind of a lighting firm that is doing studies now to create a proper uh, illumination or lighting uh, uh, for, 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 for the building. And you are going to see also a, a rendering uh, in the night here, done by this uh, company. This building deserves it, truly. Uh, you know, it is more than 50 years old, but it didn't die and it's not old. This is the gravestone of uh, Mr. Perugini. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's almost like saying, hey, death, uh, you didn't get me. I mean, I am temporarily uh, off, but uh, I keep rotating. I keep, uh, I keep believing in the diagonal and in rotation. That is, I keep believing in being rebellious. I keep believing in life. And now we are going to see the second project that I was able to find pictures of, the Mausoleo delle Fosse Ardeatine in Rome, Italy, uh, he worked with other people. Uh, you see their names there. Uh, and uh, this is the building. I, I should have, but uh, well, now I regret because I, I'm, 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 I'm on, on my way towards finding excuse why I don't know something about the, the function of the building. It's a memorial, but I imagine it's a mausoleum, you know, for some kind of fallen uh, heroes not from Ukraine, but from Italy. And what he did is very, very uh, convincing. It's this heavy, you know, slab. If we are to call it a slab, maybe there are two slabs there or so, but uh, this heavy horizontal, you know, uh, entity and underneath you can find uh, the individual graves, but they are individual, but they also collect, it's a, they create a unity, it's a, it's a collective grave. That's all there is, that's all you see. 
And you could say, so what's so special? Well, you know, once you begin to discover um, that there is, uh, even if I don't know a lot about this project, uh, you know, it, it, I think it's done very convincingly. If you look at it, just look at it, um, it's hard to, to, to avoid, you know, the thought and the feeling that here there might be some kind of a commemorative structure and mausoleum, and this is what it is. This is what it is underneath. It's exquisitely done. I mean, maybe the word exquisitely is a little bit, uh, um, you know, uh, pretentious or sensuous even. It's austere, it's simple, but it, it's also uh, sensitively done. And, and the heaviness of, the, of what is above creates indeed, I think, this, uh, this, uh, this sorrow in a way, you know, that you are already in a grave, you are looking at graves from within a grave, a, uh, you know, a, a collective grave. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's very well done. Uh, and uh, again, the same architect, Giuseppe Perugini, with very simple means, a great architecture doesn't need great words. In its silence, if it's well done, architecture can move, can move your heart and it can move your mind. And, and this, this building does, even in pictures. I also like the fact that he combines concrete work with the stonework. So you have, I mean, besides the fact that it is placed in nature, in a rather open space, um, it's, it's, it's this dialogue between the work of man and the work of God or nature. Now, the purists might protest that these things here, you know, are destroying the, the, you know, the cleanness of the building. No, these are the tires, so the, the, the tears of the building. The building is itself uh, lamenting. So the building we looked at is here. This is the power of architecture that with the simplest means, you just have this very large slab, which doesn't need words, doesn't whisper words, but in its silence, it tells you what it's supposed to tell you in this case. And I think it succeeds. It is a narrative architecture without words. These are the individual um, graves of tombs. And you see, this is the slab above. This is the stone wall uh, that surrounds uh, what is underneath. And then in between them, you have a glimpse at the trees. During construction, we are going to see also a, a sketch by the architect, the initial sketch. Also a, a, a very inspired uh, drawing, if I am to call it so. I mean, to call it inspired. Yes, this is it, you know? And I, I like even the way he, he wrote, you know, with some, some letters as if, we, let's say, if he used ink, you know, maybe from a pen with a nib, uh, some, you know, this happens. This happens sometimes when you, when you write manually, uh, it's in the character of the of the whole thing, the drawing. It's it's it shows, it, in my opinion, it shows great skill, graphic skill, Giuseppe Perugini. 
Uh, next, we'll talk about Khan, the cook himself, drew beautifully. Not too many architects today grow like Louis Kahn. Even stars. I don't know exactly what this is, but it's part of this uh, complex where the mausoleum, mausoleum is. Okay, and now we go to none other than Louis Kahn, who, who died on the 17th of, of March in um, 1974. He died in Penn Station in New York City, uh, returning from Dhaka, from Bangladesh. Uh, he died in curious circumstances. Apparently, he had, he had a heart attack in, in Penn Station in 1974. On this day, the 17th of March, and I read that for two days, the uh, New York police couldn't identify him. He was probably at that time the greatest architect in the world, not, not just in the United States. Uh, and uh, apparently the documents he had on him, he crossed out the, the address uh, where he lived. He was not a New Yorker, he lived in uh, Philadelphia. I have my own theory, which is maybe if it's possible, it's wrong. It's just, uh, you know, uh, how to say, uh, maybe I'm fantasizing, but this is my belief that Louis Kahn, upon returning from Dhaka, from Bangladesh, where he was uh, reviewing his very important work there, the um, National Assembly uh, building, uh, you know, all the, the capital of, of, of Dhaka, uh, finding himself back to the States, I think he had a terrible dilemma to go to his wife or to go to his uh, uh, other woman who gave him a, um, a son, the son who made the movie, My Architect, uh, his illegitimate son, because he did promise, uh, um, uh, you know, his mother that that when upon returning from 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 Bangladesh, he would he would go to live with them, but nobody knew that Louis Khan had two other children besides his uh, official marriage, and he was not divorced. So I imagine that once he found himself on American soil, his uh, heart broke because of the terrible tension within. On one hand, his duty, he was an Orthodox Jew. Divorce was not allowed, was out of the question. On the other hand, he committed himself towards the other woman. So I think this fractured him. And that's why he fell. That's why he died at 73. This is, this is uh, my uh, interpretation as an amateur uh, psychologist, if we are. <laughs> if I am to call myself so. So let's read, uh, let's read a little bit about this truly great architect because he was, and I have the highest uh, respect and admiration for, uh, for Luis Isador Khan because that I in the, in the middle stands for Isador, but he's known, you know, most of the time as uh, Luis Khan. This was not his um, birth name, but uh, let's hope something is, okay. Let's see, this is an image which I love. I always loved It's from the Exeter Library, in my opinion, the quintessential library, the perfect library with the X in the, uh, on the ceiling. Uh, looking upwards, you see the, 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 the symbol of what uh, knowledge in a way is, it's unending. It's, it's, you are continuously moving towards the unknown. And the X, besides its structural reasons there, is a symbol for that uh, um, unending quest for the unknown. So, Luis Isador Khan, you see he was born uh, with a different name uh, on March 5th, but in, in the old system of counting time, February 20th in 1901. But he died on March 17th in 1974, was an American architect based in Philadelphia. After working in various capacities for, for several, 
he was born in Estonia. And at five, he came with his parents to the United States. After working in various capacities for several firms in Philadelphia, he founded his own atelier in 1935. So he was already 34 years old. While continuing his private practice, he served as a design critic and professor of architecture at Yale School of Architecture from 1947 to 1957. From 1957 until his death in 1974, he was a professor of architecture at the School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania. Kahn created a style that was monumental and monolithic. His heavy buildings, for the most part, do not hide their weight, their materials, or the way they are assembled. Famous for his meticulously built works, his provocative proposals that remained unbuilt, and his teaching, Kahn was one of the most influential architects of the 20th century. He was awarded the AIA gold medal and the RIBA gold medal. At the time of his death, he was considered by some as America's foremost living architect. And I would say maybe not only America's. Here he was. And I love this picture, you know, because he's like a boy, you know, hiding with one arm uh, and one hand what, what he was sketching on, you know, on, in, in the upper right corner, we see one of his employees totally devoted to the cause of um, drawing properly, uh, you know, the building by Louis Kahn. Um, I know he, he drew a lot, he sketched a lot. I read that when he died, his wife had to sell uh, you know, uh, his furniture and his office. He was bankrupt, actually. The greatest architect in the United States and maybe in the whole world, I would say. Um, he was actually bankrupt. He was in debt. Why, you would say? Because he was not a money-making machine like so many architects today, and maybe not only today. He was interested in the excellence of his work. And I'm sure he had to pay his employees a lot of overtime with money from his own pocket because the budget for the buildings he was building was not uh, um, meant for uh, that overtime. Like, for example, for the, um, the covering, uh, the vault, uh, the, the roofing uh, above the central space in Dhaka, for two years he couldn't find the right solution. But he kept working, he kept searching for the right solution. This was fortunate because the bombers of, of, from Pakistan who were flying above Dhaka didn't bomb the, the important parliament building because, because they thought that it was already bombed because it didn't have a roofing. It didn't have it because, because the scrupulous uh, you know, uh, architect uh, kept searching for a solution and he couldn't find it at that time anyway. I also read that, uh, you know, since he became, uh, after he was 55, so this about 1955 or so, uh, he became famous. Uh, well, it's possible, who knows, maybe some of his employees uh, thought that they deserved more, maybe in terms of salary, I don't know, but I read that some of his sketches, Louis Kahn's sketches, uh, you know, began to disappear because he also signed them. And of course, it would have been a nice thing to have a, a sketch or two by, um, by the great master uh, in, in your collection. Anyway, here he is again. This man, he was short. He was, uh, some people from a conventional point of view would say he was not a beautiful man, I mean, physically. But I actually find him beautiful. Uh, if I was a lady, I probably would have fallen in love with Louis Kahn. You can tell he's an intelligent man. You know, it's, 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 it's the radiance of intelligence. And uh, uh, maybe, you know, when he was very little, I think still in Estonia, he was the victim of a fire uh, uh, he, that burned his face dramatically and that, that uh, affected the, his face until he died. It, it didn't change. And apparently his mother said, my, my son will be a great, um, great person or a great man because of this state. She interpreted uh, this terrible accident in uh, the opposite of uh, being uh, an ominous, ominous sign. 
uh, you have to understand Khan came to the States as a poor child of a poor family. They were very poor. And he be arrived at the, at the top of architecture in a country which had many important architects, in a country which had an affluence which uh, many other countries didn't have. Do you think this was easy? It was not easy. It was the result, the fruit of hard work, inspiration, standing for his uh, beliefs, talent, a lot of work, and probably also a lot of suffering, but he succeeded. Philip Johnson in that film, um, My Architect by his, uh, well, illegitimate son, if I am to call it him, to call him so, said about himself and Philip Johnson was not a modest man. And he was aware of his own accomplishments. After all, I think he was the first Pritzker Prize laureate. I'm talking about uh, Philip Johnson. He said, Louis Kahn was the artist, not him. And I think he was right. Kahn was the artist. If by the artist we understand someone who, with a full heart, with, a, with an incredible exuberance and intensity, fights for a new vision and, and and he did and he succeeded he succeeded this uh, small man small physically speaking coming from estonia as an immigrant succeeded i always love this picture you look at the intransigence of the two parallels of his two hands indeed you could say that uh, louis i khan was pointing towards the immeasurable because he said, and I keep repeating this, a great building begin, begins with the immeasurable. Then it goes through the measurable, and then in the end, it comes back to the immeasurable. So this man understood that a great building in its essence is poetry. And although it, is, it comes into being through measurements, its initial impulse and what it arrives at at the end is the immeasurable. And you can use other words for the immeasurable, the infinite, the absolute, whatever. And you see, I think in these two hands, you know, uncompromising in their parallelism, a suggestion of the absolute or the infinite he was searching for. Here is a picture with a, 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 the great, uh, um, you know, uh, roofing uh, and ceiling of the Yale Art Gallery uh, that he created, an early work by him. We are going to see more pictures with, uh, with this um, important work. Here he is again. I mean, look at his expression. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like I, 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 I am tempted to compare the expression of Louis Kahn in this picture with uh, some late portraits, self-portraits by Rembrandt, a man who at the end of his life suffered a lot because he became destitute, uh, he lost all the riches he had, but he arrived at the wisdom. And this is the, 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 the how to say, the, the, in a way, the revenge of an exceptional biography on a life which for most of us, if for not all of us, is often problematic and difficult. Here he is with his good friend, Carlos Carpa on the right. Khan, of course, in the center, and then uh, another, in my opinion, they were both great, and uh, Scarpa uh, on the right, taller. I don't know who the person on the left is. Anyway, here he is drawing with two hands. Um, yeah, he drew with two hands. Louis Kahn and his women, because I think this is an important subject with Esther, his wife. Uh, well, we start from the bottom up. Uh, here they are, uh, probably uh, recently married. Uh, he looks a little bit, um, you know, cocky, so to speak, and she, says, she feels that she's uh, in the proximity of a man who has, uh, I remember now, uh, a very amusing saying by uh, Os uh, Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde said, I always, I like a man with a future and a woman with a past. Anyway, 
back to Louis Kahn. With Anne King, uh, you know, an extramarital affair, a remarkable architect herself, um, and she has a, he had a daughter with her, with Anne King. Here is uh, here they are in his office. Right, uh, I mean uh, Kahn on the right, and uh, Anne King uh, on the left. Uh, here they are again, uh, Khan and uh, Anting. Now with Harriet Pettison, Harriet Pettison, who gave him a son, uh, a landscape architect, uh, a memoir with letters from Louis Khan, Harriet Pettison. Here they are, you know, looking happy. But uh, I think this picture was taken not too far in time from uh, from him uh, dying um, the way he died at the Penn Station. They seem to be happy here, but, you know, life uh, could uh, surprise all of us. Sketches, drawings, he drew beautifully and uh, abundantly. Um, this is a sketch for a synagogue in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Israel, which he didn't build unfortunately, but it would have been a great building. We are going to see uh, more pictures with this building, which was not built. Um, I don't, you see there the importance of a drawing. Yes, this is the title of a book with his drawings, a sketch with a Bryn Mawr uh, dormitory uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, this was a sketch for a planning for a monastery. Um, a sketch for the Richards Laboratories, which we are going to see, a sketch for the Kimball Museum in uh, Fort Worth, uh, Texas. Uh, again, bring more, um, probably some sketches for um, some hesitations here for the Richards Laboratories, which we are going to see. I go a little bit quickly, quickly because we have a lot of pictures uh, in this presentation. This is a book which I actually had. I don't know if I still have, but I had it with uh, uh, sketches and paintings uh, of uh, Louis Kahn. Um, we saw this one. Uh, his why, why do I like his drawings? Because they are not commercial. They are investigative drawings, as drawings should be, you know. You don't make the pictures to be published in magazines. You, you, you make drawings in order to study a certain, uh, you know, a certain architecture. And uh, he was also a visionary in the sense that he also had utopian, uh, uh, you know, aspirations like in like here, you know, for uh, urbanism in Philadelphia, I think, which was never never came into being, but he he thought of it. Anyway, we are going to see also some sketches and drawings and paintings even of his uh, travel uh, travels outside of of the United States. This is an urban scheme for Philadelphia, which was not realized, unfortunately, a self portrait. Uh, Vincent Scully, he's a good friend at Yale University, an important historian and theoretician, said that in the case of Louis Kahn, there was the light of a candle and the laser light. In other words, he, he was looking both simultaneously towards the past and the future. study trips, Siena, the pyramids, Egypt again, Pestum, the south of Italy, Siena again, Imhotep's step pyramid, the first pyramid built by uh, Imhotep, King Zoser's vizier and architect, considered the first architect ever in history, Imhotep at Saqqara in Egypt, uh, Siena. Early works. I'm going to show some works which you, you are not so well known because they, they belong to that period when Louis Kahn was not famous. But they are important, I think. 
these, these works were done before he went to Rome at the Academy in Rome as a fellow. A Mill Creek project is, is with housing, social housing, inexpensive housing. And I'm very happy that Luis Kahn uh, worked for such, for, for such a program, uh, not ignoring uh, you know, the needs of those uh, less, uh, less advantaged. And I think it still has nobility as an architecture. Uh, I'm not sure they still exist. I, uh, I'm tempted to think that they do not any longer. But uh, if this is the case, and I think this is the case, it's very sad. Because, you know, th these buildings were still created by this very important architect, and they still have something, so to speak, that, that makes them uh, valuable. Uh, look at the planning. The planning also, he did all these buildings, or most of them. They, they you know, it, it's, it's, it's a spirited uh, composition. It's rigorous, but it's not dogmatic, it's not rigid. There is a sense of play here. Now, the Coward Shoes Company in Philadelphia is this building, you know, who would have expected? Uh, but compare it with the building on the left and the building on the right, and it's a building that um, says, yes, we live in modern times, something the cars do not say, it. although I love these cars because I'm a nostalgic man. But you see the difference. This building, if you build this building just as it is today, it would stand out as a contemporary building and so on, but not the cars. Nobody would, uh, would do cars like this any longer unless they are just, uh, you know, uh, recreations. Now, we arrive at the art gallery that I, we already saw a picture of from 1951, the Yale University Art Gallery in New Haven, Connecticut. Here he is looking upwards, looking towards his future, uh, at least uh, until his arrival from uh, Dhaka at uh, Penn Station. Uh, uh, you know, here we see the power of architecture, uh, uh, you know, uh, essentially architecture can, man can manifest itself with simple means, but there is richness here. This, um, this uh, um, uh, roof that he created, this ceiling is structurally sound, but it's also aesthetically pleasant. And you are going to see a, 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 a drawing of the ceiling plan, which, which is beautiful besides being the so-called correct uh, functionally and uh, uh, you know, structurally um, you know, uh, legitimate. Uh, triangular uh, uh, staircase, we are going to see the plan. Yale University Art Gallery, it was designed by Louis Kahn in 1953. He was not yet famous. He became famous with the Trenton uh, public bath and the Richards Laboratories, mainly the Richards Laboratories. This is the ceiling plan of the building of the Yale um, Art Gallery. And I think it's beautiful. I mean, graphically, I think it's beautiful. It's simple, it's complex. There is multiplicity in unity. It's also ornamental. The structure became ornamental. And um, the ornament became structural. It's very fine, I think. He was a very rigorous architect. He didn't leave things, uh, you know, uh, without paying attention to them because they were so-called details. As it was said, architecture doesn't have details. Everything is part of a whole. And thus, everything is important. The city tower project in Philadelphia from 1952, but from what I know, from what I read, in this case, perhaps the, the contribution of Van Ting, his lover at the time, was higher than uh, was actually acknowledged. Uh, Louis Kahn and Van Ting, but maybe it would have been uh, more accurate to say Van Ting and Louis Kahn, because uh, it truly is an architecture that is a little different from what Kahn did before or after. Here they are, the two of them. I don't know who the man on the right is. Maybe the, the Estonian uh, 
structural engineer, himself a remarkable uh, creator, and we are going to talk about him. Uh, here is Anting with a with a tower they created, but maybe maybe instead of saying Louis Kahn and Anting, maybe we could say Anting and Louis Kahn. Uh, it doesn't really matter, you know. The it's not about hierarchies. One thing is for sure, she had a significant role here. Here she is explaining, I don't know, in a lecture, she was very preoccupied by this kind of geometry and uh, it, it was part of her interests, architectural interests, uh, more than, uh, than, than, than Louis Kahn. Uh, here she is with, uh, with Kahn uh, on the left and I don't know who is on the right. Anyway, uh, here is uh, on the right uh, Harriet Pattison. We already, uh, we already uh, saw a picture with them, and on the left, uh, Louis Kahn, the, the eternal, um, you know, seductive architect, uh, with Anne Ting, the Rome letters from 1953 to 1954. Uh, here is the project for this remarkable tower, and I really regret it was not built. And uh, I wonder if it cannot still be built. Um, yes, it would have been a, a beautiful tower, simple and complex at the same time. You know, I look at this picture and it's impossible for me not to be moved. Because, because really culture is about curiosity and it's about invention, it's about creativity. You know, you see these people, you know, looking at the model and, you know, I'm sure they have an interesting discussion, they have questions, they have, have a half answers or full answers or wrong answers. It doesn't matter. What's important is that architecture and the practice of architecture is an adventure. And those who do it are adventurers, they are pioneers, and they are supposed to be pioneers. Too bad it was not built, but uh, you know, what can we do? Uh, architects always produce works that, uh, I mean, not all are, 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 are built. Now the Trenton bus, a very important, a small work, you know, in terms of dimensions, but very significant for the evolution of Louis Kahn and for the evolution of modern architecture in general. This was built between 1954 and 1959. In 1959, he was already a 58 years old man. Louis Kahn was not, uh, you know, uh, an enfant terrible. He started late. He arrived at fame when he was around 55 years old. Not like today when you have uh, already famous people at 30 or if not 25 or 35, he was 55. Uh, uh, this, is the, this is the building. The plan is classical, is, uh, is simple. Uh, you say, what's so great about it? There are just some uh, four squares with a courtyard square, two in the middle. Well, you know, it's, 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 not, it's, not, it's not so simple. Uh, the, I mean, it is simple, but it's not simplistic. Uh, I love this building. You know, it's 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 just what it has to be, and it's it's literally about the eternity to be found within transitoriness. The building is not claiming to be a pyramid, but its composition uh, belongs to a quest for the eternal, for that immeasurable that he he mentioned. Uh, in that saying that I, I, uh, I reproduced. It's a, it's a belief in order, but it's not an oppressive order. Order in Greek means cosmos. Uh, this should make us think a little bit, you know. So, uh, we use the word order and the, and the policeman has a vision about uh, or an understanding of what order is. Um, Vladimir Putin has another vision about what order is, but order means cosmos in Greek. And uh, I wonder how many of us think about that these days. That is to bring into the work a cosmic dimension. 
the, the, the order of nature is a spontaneous order, is a different kind of order, qualitatively different from the often simplistic and oppressive or so-called order that we humans create. It's a perfect building. The wall, you see clearly how it was built. The ceiling, you see how it was built. It's comprehensible, yet it surprises you. Um, this is something which I cannot truly really say about the works of the last uh, uh, Pritzker Prize laureate, uh, Mr. Kerr. It doesn't surprise me. And I'm, I, I, I hope I can write a, uh, something with the title, No Bell. Well, playing with the word because the Pritzker is considered the Nobel Prize in Architecture. But I played with it. I, I separated no and bell and I added an, a second L. So no bell became no bell. Because I think a good work is, is a bell. Bell, B-E-L-L. -L. It, it, it generates a sound. It wakes you up. And the work of uh, Francis Carey doesn't wake me up. I'm very sorry. Aesthetically, at least it doesn't. Or architecturally. Maybe, you know, from other points of view, uh, maybe, but uh, not architecturally. Anyway, a drawing for the Trenton bus by Louis Kahn. A uh, view from the top, what could be simpler, but not simplistic. You know, this building could have been very rigid because yes, he operates with uh, squares, uh, but the fragility of existence and even the fragility of architecture is suggested by these uh, fragile uh, or discrete connections between the cubicles or between the squares at the corner. There is always or frequently in the work of Louis Kahn explicitly or implicit, implicitly uh, um, the diagonal. And these, uh, these uh, fragile connections the, uh, do express like, like using his own words vis-a-vis -vis his uh, friend's works, Carlos Scarpa, the adoration of the joint. It's, it's, a, it's about joining. And, and, and the art of joining is, is truly maybe uh, at the very core of what architecture is or should be. Here, there are several projects by him. We are going to see almost all of them, if not all of them, um, uh, later on in detail. The first one in the corner is the Exeter Library. Here is the Trenton Library, the Ol Olivetti uh, Factory, um, the Kimball Museum, I don't know what this is, but anyway, we'll arrive at them. Still, the Trenton bus, bus, uh, public bus in uh, New Jersey. A picture, a more recent picture. Now, the Richards Laboratory. Truly, with this building, Louis Kahn became a prominent uh, presence in in architecture. It was this building that uh, brought a lot of attention to Louis Kahn. And uh, we can uh, thank not just him, but also August uh, Commandant. August uh, Commandant was the brilliant engineer, structural engineer who collaborated with Khan on this project, but they also collaborated um, on, uh, on, on the building at the uh, Kimball uh, Art Museum in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, a, a very good engineer, an excellent engineer. I understood they had some conflicts because, you know, when you have uh, two brilliant people, uh, you know, uh, uh, working together, it is exactly because of their brilliance that some conflict here and there might arise. Anyway, the cover of the, um, uh, of the book uh, written by this engineer, he also was born in Estonia, I think, and uh, you know, he wrote about, uh, about Louis Kahn, 18 years with the architect Louis Kahn. Here he is with the work he collaborated um, with Moshe Safdi for the habitat in Montreal, habitat uh, 67. So he, he was an architect who worked with other important architects, not just with uh, Louis Kahn. So August uh, Commandant, uh, you see, he was uh, five years younger than Louis Kahn. 
was an Estonian American structural engineer whose collaboration with famous architects and engineers resulted in several 20th century, uh, century architectural masterpieces. His professional career spanned more than half a century <clears throat> from uh, 1930s to 1980s <clears throat> and coincided with, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, with an era characterized by modernization, urbanization, and the rapid development of technology. This is the Richards Laboratories with a beautiful uh, tall slender brick uh, towers inspired by San Gimignano in Italy um, that, that Louis Kahn and Auguste uh, Commandant <clears throat> built together. Look at the structure. I don't know if Bruce is still here, but if he is, maybe he could say something about this uh, structure. My intuition is that's all I have. That, uh, is something remarkable here because the corner of the building is the most vulnerable part of the building and to be able to you know make it stand and uh, also free it at the same time is in my opinion a, a challenge and he succeeded but not only there you know it's you can tell here that structure is serving architecture and they truly collaborate just like in that sketch that le corbusier made with two hands, um, you know, uh, in uh, equal proportion present on the page, the engineers and the architects, and, 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 and they together create the building. There is no hierarchy between them. They are together, the engineer and the architect, the architect and the engineer. In this building, uh, Louis Kahn used his uh, famous uh, dichotomy serving spaces and served spaces. The towers contain the serving spaces, the technical aspects of the building, parts of the buildings, uh, pipes and so on, uh, you know, uh, bathrooms uh, and, 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 the, and the served spaces were the laboratories themselves. He wanted to, he wanted to have this, uh, um, uh, you know, have these distinctive spaces for both. He was afraid, Louis Kahn, that if he would let the pipes, you know, just manifest themselves freely, they would take over the building. And he was afraid of that. So he imprisoned them in, in these towers, in this building. But he, this quest for order was always present with him. So the Richards Laboratories in, in Philadelphia, you can see the the, the plan at the bottom on the right. I had the chance to see this building. Uh, I was there. And uh, at that time when I was there, I, I noticed there was a lot of aluminum, aluminum foil in the windows because yes, um, you know, uh, this can didn't uh, consider perhaps this aspect that the sunlight could disturb the research activity of the, of the people using the, the labs which are these spaces, the squares. Uh, so the scientists protected themselves with the aluminum foil that was in the windows. Uh, where you see even the, the, the pipes, let's call them so, they are, he thought of them too. He didn't just let the engineer, you know, he collaborated with the with engineers, but, but but he wanted order, an integral order. It was an integral uh, organism, the building he built. And these are the San Gimignano towers, medieval towers that he saw in Italy when he was a, a fellow at the Academy, uh, American Academy in Rome. And uh, from what I read, he was influenced by these towers. And uh, they found uh, a new expression in the Richards laboratories in Philadelphia. But as opposed to the postmoderns, as we know them, in the case of Louis Kahn, he absorbed, he digested the past and transformed it. It was transfigured. It was not, uh, his uh, bringing history into his building was, was not. Uh, based on uh, mimicry was was not a mimicking uh, action. It was uh, it, it was digested. His immersion in in the past was uh, was uh, was deep, and he was able to transform what he learned from the past in innovative ways, as you can see here. 
you know this is a creative building that says yes to the present its present and the future and still is connected with the past medieval uh, in this case perhaps uh, relating to san gimignano in italy this is what good art does this is what good architecture does it, uh, it 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 finds itself on the spiral of time where there are no uh, really frontiers there are distinctive moments but there is also continuity his building perhaps would have been admired in the middle ages just as he admired symmetrically the towers of san gimignano and of course it helps to have a brilliant engineer on your side it does and he did now uh, a house which was itself abandoned um why do i say itself because previously we saw the work of uh, perugini where his experimental house was abandoned now we look at a building, a uh, less known building by Louis Kahn that was uh, apparently abandoned, but was not destroyed. I think he did it also together with Anting. It helps to be in love and he was in love. And uh, when you are in love, you are more inspired. Unfortunately, perhaps the French are right. Il n'y a pas d'amour heureux. There is no happy life, uh, happy love. And uh, in their case, it wasn't either. And Ting suffered a lot. Uh, you know, she 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 bore him a daughter, and uh, at one moment they, you know, they broke off. But uh, what can we do? Uh, she appears in that film, My Architect, and uh, I suggest you see it because it's it's a good and moving film. A young man searching for his father. The father didn't actually he didn't actually have because he was an illegitimate son. Anyway, this is the building. Uh, forget the uh, you know this is almost like found uh, furniture on the street, but the building still has you know the roof, which is that transition between the earth and the sky, and it has the integrity and the spatial and the visual interest of something you know, uh, that is referring to what I said earlier, a bell, B-E-L-L. -L. I like this roof. The, you could make almost a chapel here if you get rid of these, uh, you know, uh, pieces of furniture and uh, ar the architecture in itself has uh, uh, meanings uh, beyond, uh, you know, those declare I'm a house. But then a chapel itself is a house. Now, Arts United Center in Fort Wayne, Indiana, this, I will not read this text because we have a lot of information to go through. Uh, it is a kind of a failed project. Uh, he was unable to build all the parts. It was supposed to be a complex, a large, uh, you know, almost a campus. Uh, he built, this is the theater which is the closest to his vision. And I would say he would have, he probably would have agreed that the facade of the theater did belong to him, to what Louis Kahn stood for. Because I see here a mask and the theater is connected, of course, with, 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 with masks. But otherwise, even inside the building, this building uh, is, um, there are things that are problematic, not so much here, but uh, we are going to see, uh, like here, these, uh, these arches, to me, they are too weak to truly represent uh, Louis Kahn at his best. Uh, it's an impure project. Uh, not many by, by him had this uh, fate, but this one did, and that's why he was very unhappy with it. But here and there, we have glimpses at uh, you know, the work of, of the great architect he was. It happens because architecture is a collective work and uh, your vision sometimes is, um, is not uh, properly brought into being. Uh, so you see at the very bottom, uh, often frustrating realities of making architecture. Yes, it was frustrating because he couldn't realize his vision as he wanted to 
and that was it. Well, we have a lot of other works to see. The Yale Center for British Art, again, it's a newer work, a more recent work, as opposed to the Yale Art Gallery that we saw. This is a brilliant work. I like it very much because it's able to bring together the opposites, the monumentality of concrete work, uh, and, and then the intimacy of the wooden paneling of the building. So there is both intimacy and um, you know, the authority of, of, of a public space. Uh, the softness of wood and the, you know, the cold rigidity of concrete, they collaborate and even chromatically and then balance each other. So this is the building, uh, the Yale collection of British art at the Yale University. Uh, this is the plan. light as you know was very very important for Louis Kahn and he created always um, you know specific ways of bringing light properly into the building here for an art uh, collection I think he did the right thing we'll see also at Kimball at the Kimball Art Museum a different uh, uh, solution if I am to use this word um, also the ceiling is important you look up, what do you see? Just a hanged banal ceiling? No, you know, here again, it's, it's, uh, it's the ceiling and the roof belong to that uh, transitory, transitory uh, section of the building between the earth and the sky. And so the symbolism is, uh, is, uh, is important. So this is the British Yale, uh, uh, the, the Museum of British Art at Yale University by Louis Kahn. Now the first Unitarian church in Rochester, New York, uh, you know, brick walls, uh, there is concrete work too. Uh, it's, it's, it's an excellent building. And uh, I said this when I made the other presentation about him, that what is perhaps surprising here is that the cross on the, on the upper part of the building is the dark solid one. Uh, and, 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 and it's not what commonly is done where the cross being a, you know, a Christian building is made of light. Here, the light is at the corners, not in the center. The cross is not of light, it's the opposite. But you still perceive it uh, you know, uh, very potently as, as a cross. An interesting conception. Just like in the uh, public bus at Trenton, uh, you see the walls as they were made, a block above another block above another block. They are not hidden behind plaster or whatever. Good architecture is very often, if not always, sincere, is honest, is vigorous in its honesty. Now, Olivetti Underwood Factory in Harrisburg, USA, uh, even, you see, even in the case of a factory, a plant, even in the case of a factory, a good architect creates something unexpected, different, a bell. <laughs> by the way of, of the essay I hope to write called, called Nobel in the case, uh, by the way, of uh, the new Pritzker Prize. Anyway, here uh, also he worked with uh, August uh, Commandant, the brilliant Estonian-American engineer. Brilliance has no frontiers. It can be born anywhere. It can function anywhere. It doesn't matter. Well, of course, the environment has uh, an importance, but uh, I think uh, God was uh, equally generous with uh, it, it doesn't matter, you know, what part of the world someone is born. 
there is talent, there is intelligence, there is uh, uh, vision even uh, everywhere. It just needs the conditions to, to manifest themselves. And that's a problem in some parts of the world, you know, and it's very sad there are capable people who are born in uh, unfortunate circumstances or, uh, you know, they are, they are uh, babies uh, under a sky filled with bombers and, and their lives do not flourish. Well, you look at the structure here, you know, it, it's, it's also ornamental. It's also, yes, it's structure, but it's intriguing in sculptural terms as well. You know, it is functional, it's, uh, it functions as a as structure, but it also has that sense of order. You know, you look at it. The only disorder here or deviant uh, part is this little uh, room in the corner, which shows, in my opinion, again, the, you know, the unexpectedness, you know, uh, of, of, of a great talent. Because a great talent, I, I, I really doubt, let's say something like this might have been conceived by many, maybe, maybe, I'm not so sure, but very few would have added something like this here in the corner. And this is not oriented towards uh, Mecca, like he did, for example, for the mosque uh, in Dhaka. No, I don't know what function is here, but this shows the playfulness, the capriciousness even of the, of the good architect, you know, uh, because in the end, perhaps everything is some kind of a play. You know, like space and time do not exist, as um, the quotation from uh, from uh, Strindberg sounded. And if space and time do not exist, then uh, such gestures uh, could be uh, could be legitimate, even if they appear to be illegitimate. Deviant art, great art, always has a deviant side. The Exeter Library. Now we finally arrive. I say finally because I began with an image from Exeter Library. In my opinion, is a, is a, is 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 a perfect building. I know it was criticized because you don't know where the entrance is. It's perfectly symmetrical, but to me this is a metaphor for what uh, the quest for knowledge is. How do you enter in your adventure towards knowledge? Is there a triumphal entrance between two lions? No, no. It, it implies the 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 you know the the adventure at, at find, uh, finding your own way in the labyrinth of uh, of the unknown. But this is not explicitly a labyrinth. It's very strict. It's cubical. It's uh, square in plan, but. You don't know, you look at the building, where is the entrance? Well, you find it. You find it. If you are in quest for knowledge, you find it. I actually like the fact that you don't know where the entrance is. And this is the plan. It's perfect. It has the, the core, which is a, you know, a sublime uh, in address to the unknown with, a, with the X right there. And then you have uh, the books, and then at the edge of the periphery, you have the individual tables for individual studies. It's, it's, it's truly the paradigmatic library. And uh, whatever Mr. M. Kolhas might say, in my opinion, this building is superior to his library in Seattle uh, on many levels. It's much more serious and it's much more sensitive. Maybe it's not so eye-catching, although if this uh, atrium is not so-called uh, eye-catching, or I should say heart-catching, or imagination-catching, I don't know what it is. It's truly an emblem of the unknown. Yes, it's monumental. Yes, it has, uh, it is rhetorical, but but that's because Louis Kahn was searching for that sense of order, which means cosmos in Greek. I know not, not too many people believe in this any longer because we are too cynical for that. 
uh, look, uh, the plans, the sections, everything is part of a whole, every part claims to be part of the same whole. There is multiplicity in unity. Everything is perfect, really. The, and I don't often use the word perfect, but in this case, I do. How else am I to describe this building? It functions, it functions symbolically. You look at the, scale, uh, the sections, you look at the plans, you look at the built work, you look at photographs. It's, it surprises you continuously, even though you already saw it. You know, this is what a good work is, and not just in architecture, in literature, in music. You listen to a good, uh, good music many times, and every time you discover new things, although you know it. It's the same with the building. Very often, we don't think about the symbolic value uh, of architecture. But, but without uh, that, without symbolism, architecture becomes prose, becomes, it's not poetry. Here is another building built by Louis Kahn, the dining hall the, uh, of uh, Exeter Library, of Exeter uh, uh, University, uh, excellent school, uh, truly one of the best in the United States and in the world. So this is the library in construction. This is the dining hall. We are going to arrive at it too because it's also a good building. You see these uh, individual uh, desks for uh, individual study are very inviting for just that. You know, they are, it's almost something a little bit monastic here. You know, it's about the, the intimacy of reading a book, you know, we, and it's important, you know, yes, you are in a, clearly in a public building with a public ethos, but you also have uh, the intimacy of uh, your own uh, desk and your own chair in the proximity of the window. I think it's very well done. Now the dining hall at Exeter, so this is the library and this is the dining hall. Um, some people might say it's too monumental for a dining hall. I don't know. I, I still find it uh, inspiring. Uh, it's true that usually I'm against the large pieces of glass, but in this case, I'm not. Well, it's also, you know, this building was not built, you know, in recent years. It was, uh, was built, uh, you know, about uh, 60 years ago. Yes, it's a, it, it has a medieval, kind of feeling because of these powerful brick walls, massive walls. Uh, but it's a, it's, it's a monumental architecture, which it, some people think is a little bit cold inside, but it is architecture. You look at it and you, you, you say, uh, this is architecture. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's almost about the otherness of architecture, the otherness of good architecture. Maybe he was a little bit too serious for a dining room. I am saying something maybe uh, I should not have said, you know, because uh, we are so obsessed with eating and with menus and, you know, uh, cooking and kitchen that uh, we forget that actually we eat in order to live and not the other way around. Unfortunately, many people, I think, uh, live in order to eat. Well, the buildings that Louis Kahn built, this building that he built are for people who eat in order to live and not the other way around, yes. Salk Institute, another great work by him, La Jolla, California, uh, built for scientists who studied uh, in the field of um, you know, medical arts. Uh, this was established, founded by Dr. Dr. Jonas Salk, who discovered the uh, the vaccine against the poliomyelite, I think. And from what I read in an old architecture d'aujourd'hui, Jonas Holt told him only one thing <laughs> to Louis Kahn, make a, you know, a research laboratory where I could invite Picasso. This is what I read. And uh, Kahn tried and I think he succeeded. Uh, I also want to say that this space between these two rows of buildings 
uh, he initially wanted to have some plants, some planting, you know, vegetation, but he consulted himself with Luis Barragan, the great Mexican architect uh, and landscape architect. In fact, Luis Barragan considered himself a landscape architect, but he was both, of course, he was an architect, trained actually as an engineer. Anyway, Barragan told him, do not put any vegetation and, and can, listened and I think he, he, he chose correctly. Uh, and you'll see soon why. Because this is a very pure world. It's like the pure science. You know, you have this uh, straight thin line of water going towards the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's really the space of spirit. Uh, that the, the architectural language is very strict in a way. But again, Luis Kahn is a master of combining concrete with wood. This is, these panels, uh, paneling is done with teak, a very lightweight wood. And, but this, he's able to, in my opinion, in opposition to Tadao Ando, who doesn't combine wood with concrete, although I don't know if you know, Tadao Ando lives in a complete, in a wooden house. The house he received from his parents, totally made of wood, not concrete, but he is the master of concrete. Well, as I said, Luis Kahn combines the, the light of a candle with the light of laser. So we have wood and we have concrete. And we have the sky and we have the water and we have the Pacific Ocean in front of us. Uh, and uh, I, I, I said this before and I didn't double check. I think at the equinox, the sun either sets here or the sun rises right here in, 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 in line with this thing. This is really the work of spirit for spirit. It's a great work and, uh, and, and this great work uh, spiritually of significance, it's also the locus where people uh, recently, I mean, uh, you know, newly wed, uh, you know, they take pictures of each other. Can you imagine in a campus dedicated to science and research for uh, vaccines and so on, the newly wed in this area come here and take pictures? Why? You ask why? Because, because it, uh, because somehow in a sublime way, uh, the highest uh, meets uh, the most uh, in a way earthy. And, and I think this is what great art does and great architecture does. You see the rooms of the scientists, they all have a window that faces the Pacific Ocean because science also needs contemplation. Science also needs dreaming in the absence of dreams in the absence of imagination, science cannot function either. So the buildings, they are all honoring the ocean, the great ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and the sunlight, of course, or the moonlight. And yes, water is important. Uh, I wish I had other pictures. I have to work harder on this presentation. Now we go to a different work Bryn Mawr dormitory in Pennsylvania. We saw some sketches with it. And it's, it's again, uh, modern monasticism in a way. It's, it's um, yeah, I, I read that some people uh, are a little bit uncomfortable by these concrete uh, massive walls. I would understand why, but then there are the Persian rugs, which, uh, you know, soften, soften the, uh, the interior. It's, it's a great conception, maybe indeed a little bit austere inside. This is the plan, um, yeah, similar in a way to the Exeter Library, because you have the individual units towards the periphery, and then in the center you have, uh, you know, the, the collective spaces, the public space. It's like a citadel. A more, I think in the case of Louis Kahn, there was always something medieval, so to speak, always, but transformed in, through a modern language, architectural language. Uh, 
I don't know. I feel a little bit uh, uneasy to to whisper again or to to recite again the little poem that he wrote when he was invited to write a foreword to the works of uh, Le Doux and Boulet. But I guess uh, I should do it. So here it is. Spirit in will to express can make the great sun seem small. The sun is thus the universe. Did we need Bach? Bach is thus music is. Did we need Boulet? Did we need Le Doux? Boulet is. Le do is, thus architecture is. This is what Louis Kahn wrote. And you see, he began with the word spirit. Then he, he, he referred to the sun. That's why I keep saying his architecture is not just above, about you know, what is happening at the terrestrial level. He doesn't ignore that, but he realizes there is another reality, a so-called above, the elsewhere, the otherness of cosmos or the, so there are two realities uh, merging and, and, and uh, the sacred and the profane, if we are to use the title of a book by Mircea Eliade, they exist, they coexist in the work of Louis Kahn. Now Kimball Museum in Fort Worth, another great work by him. It's a museum, but it's a museum which is, um, you know, the Citadel of Art, it's a, you know, if I am to talk in prosaic terms, it's a storage space for art, but there is also the symbolism. This vault, this open vault expresses the open endness of culture, the quest for other things, for other art. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, not, it's not frozen, the museum, it's open. Although the, 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 the composition is, uh, you know, uh, strict, rigorous. Look at the light, how, how light, you know, is, 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 is uh, coming down on the vault and then on the walls. He studied very carefully the, 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 uh, the way natural light uh, accesses the, um, the artworks and the museum without disturbing uh, the artworks. You will see some uh, some details of that. It's a great work. It's rigorous. It's so-called classical. It's modern. It's anti-classical, just like Palladio. is uh, eternal and it's also transitory or ephemeral because it because there are gestures towards that, like this open, you know, this additional, ap apparently useless, uh, you know. Uh, open um, vault, uh, it, 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 the, the gesture of fragility or towards fragility compensates the otherwise the massivity of, um, you know, uh, what is, uh, you know, stable and permanent. Look here, there are curves, you know, this, the radius of these curves, uh, they don't have the same uh, center. It's, um, it's very interesting, you know, I, I, I didn't study sufficiently well, but I noticed it. There are subtle things here, very subtle things. And this, this, is, this, is, this is what architecture is about. You know, look at, the, look at the working drawings. And I said this a few weeks ago too. In my opinion, it's beautiful. I mean, artistically beautiful, although it is a working drawing. You know, it's manually drawn. But, but you feel the sensitivity, the specificity, specificity of making architecture in a sensitive way and in a spiritually convincing way as well. Now, I mentioned this before and I mentioned it again. In my opinion, this is un unfair to unthink. It's only him being shown here. She is not even mentioned. But the work was done to, by them together, Kahn and Ting, and Ting and Louis Kahn. This was an exhibition at the Kimball Museum in Texas at uh, Fort Worth. Uh, and the, here you can see his study and the sections through these uh, exhibitional spaces. You know, he very, very carefully considered the arrival of natural light on the on the on the walls they are almost 
light is caressing the artworks. Uh, and uh, this is important. You know, you cannot rely only on artificial light. Natural light is important too. And on the other hand, you cannot uh, uh, affect, I mean, uh, direct uh, uh, sun ray could affect, you know, uh, oil painting or whatever. So that's why it is indirectly uh, contributing to the atmosphere inside the uh, inside the inside the room. I didn't see this building. I regret. I would have liked to see it. I imagine it's it's magical the inside, you know, and it's simple. It's uh, this is this is what characterizes, in my opinion. Uh, the best works of Louis Kahn. They are both audacious and modest. Uh, Renzo Piano built another museum here. So this is Renzo Piano and this is uh, Louis Kahn. Now Dhaka, Bangladesh. The hospital. Let's begin with the hospital, the most unusual hospital. Look at this. <laughs> you know, I think great architecture, like great any art, and I include here music and anything else, surprises us. You know, how come, you know, this cannot be a hospital. Well, it is a hospital. Not with a lot of technology. Bangladesh at that time was one of the poorest countries in the world, but not poor spiritually. In fact, it was enlightened enough and rich enough spiritually to commission Louis Khan to build important buildings in their country and in Dhaka. Bravo to them. An inspiration which unfortunately the United States didn't have, nor France for Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier was commissioned in Chandigarh by India and uh, Louis Kahn by Bangladesh in, uh, in Dhaka. Anyway, I love this hospital. I love it because I wonder if you, of course, to, to, be, to be ill, to be sick, it's, it's tragic, it's, uh, it's uh, painful, it's uh, difficult. But I imagine being in this building, this building, maybe I am, I am uh, too romantically inclined in what I say now, but I think it's important your state of mind. If you are uplifted and you could say, how could you be uplifted? What is here to be uplifted by? Because, you know, you see the raw materials is rather, you know, uh, primitive. I don't know, for me it is uplifting because I, I see these huge openings into the wall, which are bridges between the inside and the outside. They're almost like promises or, or, or encouragements not to be afraid. You are not alone. This is what these large openings, circular openings in the wall say, you are not alone. And this is perhaps the most important thing someone who is ill should, should know. We all die one day or another, but knowing that you are part of a, of, of a larger community, of a larger group of uh, uh, people and stars that you are not alone is crucial, I think. I love this building. It's the most unusual hospital that I ever saw. This is again, the power of, of, of creativity. It, it creates, uh, uh, unexpected, uh, uh, if we are to call them solutions. Look at this. Yes, this person here suffers, but these large openings tell him or her, don't be afraid. Of course, it's easy to say fear does exist. But um, uh, as Picasso said, uh, you know, la taxe est une fuite en avant, meaning you attack. You actually feel like running away, but instead of running away, you run towards what you are afraid of. The government buildings in Dhaka. Now tell me which, which country in the world has political buildings like this, ministries. You know, it's almost amazing. 
you know, it's amazing. This is the work of spirit for spirit. Yes, you could say they are brutal, they are massive, they are primitive, they are archetypal, but I think these are qualities because this is not about the lies of architecture and the lies of politicians, you know, hiding behind plastered walls and cushioned things and softness and so on. No, this is maybe, maybe about the brutality of truth, but it's preferable to have something like this than to have, uh, you know, uh, uh, suave uh, columns with uh, chic or uh, embellished capitals, I mean, the columns and uh, all the rest and, uh, you know, uh, soft um, rugs and uh, now, now, the decisions taken uh, affect everybody. And um, again, if I am to compare this building with the governmental buildings all over the world, here I see the, totally different vision. It's a heroic vision, yes. And this is the main building. This is the building I mentioned that the bombers of Pakistan, because unfortunately wars existed, exist, and I, I hate to say it, will exist. We're flying above this building, which didn't have uh, here solved the, the, the problem of covering the central space. And they thought it was already bombed. And this saved it from, from being really bombed. This is the, the building that is called the assembly hall uh, uh, building. And here it is. It's a fantastic architecture. It's a science fiction architecture built in one of the poorest country, countries at that time in the world. But again, not poor spiritually. And look at the interior. I think it's magnificent. You know, it's sophisticated, it's simple, it's, uh, it's but not simplistic, is uh, uh, inspiring because of its dimension of uh, verity in unity and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, yes, the, 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 the sincerity of expression. And, but this sincerity is not dogmatic and it's not simplistic and it's not oppressive. Yes, maybe towards the outside, there are certain things which some people think that they are a little bit formalistic. Yes, there is always some criticism, some of it valid. Why not? But uh, all in all, it's a gener generous uh, architectural uh, conception. It's a fortress. It's a citadel. It's the political citadel of Dhaka. In, in, in Bangladesh and, and, and they are very fortunate to have it. Here is the mosque and uh, a, a, a beautiful building and we are going to see a few images from the inside. He died, as I said, in 1974 when the building was not yet totally finalized, especially the what is around it, the landscape and so on. This was done after he died. Um, who knows, maybe if you were still alive, certain things would have been done a little, a little bit differently. This is what he searched for for two years. <laughs> and only after two years he found it. And uh, fortunately, as I said, the Pakistanis bombers who were flying above the building, having no roof here, they thought was already bombed. Uh, what can we say? Sometimes fate is favorable, but it's a great uh, solution, so to speak. You know, the octagon again, the, the magical octagon. <clears throat> and uh, this is what creation is, really. It, it's, it's again, it's, it's about the adventure of, 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 of uh, arriving at what seems to be very simple, but it's so difficult to arrive at. This is the, the ceiling of the mosque. And I admire very much this, this mosque. It's of course built for a specific religion, 
for Islam, but I think it belongs to any religion, to all religions, <clears throat> because it's the room of spirit and of light. And, uh, and the sunlight uh, does not belong to any religious denomination. It belongs to all of them. You try to imagine that you walk through this building and you are flooded with this circular light here. You know, it's, it's hard for me to believe that, that you are totally indifferent. No, I, I, I think it moves you. Normally, it should move you. Again, the mosque. You know, the, the most unusual mosque done with a, a simple means in a way. It's a great work. It really is. Dhaka, Bangladesh, Louis Khan. The Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad, India. I think he worked here with, without a commission. I don't think, if I remember correct, <clears throat> I don't think he was paid. <clears throat> Maybe he, was, he wasn't paid even in Dhaka. You know, it was love work. It was love work. I, I saw some ba Bangladesh, uh, I, I don't know how they are called, some architects from Bangladesh who had tears in their eyes when they were interviewed about Louis Khan. Yes. Uh, God, unfortunately, I did something wrong here. I am in the darkness. I forgot to turn off the light when I started the presentation, and now I, I am uh, I am crippled by uh, this is this is severe. I'm sorry because uh, uh, I was afraid this would happen, and it did happen. Uh, by mistake, I, I pressed on the on the last um, on the button uh, with the last uh, last words, which are his uh, private residences. Yes, I think I'm here. Okay, so uh, again, we are in Ahmedabad in India, and this is the Institute of Management uh, that he built. You would say, why would the Institute of Management need a heroic architecture? I think we need heroism at all levels. It makes us better human beings, more interesting, more vital, uh, more sincere, uh, loving truth and fighting for it. And the buildings, yes, they are fortresses or fortress-like. Uh, look at this. Now, who would have, who would have the, the courage to, to, to propose such an institute of management or any other function? Well, Louis Kahn did. It doesn't have windows, I mean, as we know them. You know, it's a different conception about what architecture is. Well, it has behind, it's like there are two skins, two, uh, yeah, two screens between the exterior and the interior. But the interplay between light and shadow are, are, are dramatic, is dramatic. And uh, now we'll look at his private houses because this man who had some uh, interest in uh, heroic uh, public architecture, he was able also to build private houses. The Fisher House in Pennsylvania, an excellent house, really. It's uh, cubical, it's simple, it's modern, it's modernistic, but not only modern, because of his ability to marry the candle with the laser light, the wood with the, with the, with the concrete, or even stone, uh, like here. Uh, the geometry is strict, uh, but uh, because he uses natural materials, the geometry becomes uh, sensitive. Um, and also, again, the rotation. You see that there are, there are two uh, cubes, if you want, uh, a meeting at the corner, I mean, this building at the corner, and it's rotated at 45 degrees. 
which, which represents a disruption. But this disruption refers to the dynamic uh, qualities of life and architecture as a whole. This, you know, this could have been banal boxes, but they are not banal. In my opinion, they are not banal. Yes, they are boxes, but they are still integrated somehow in nature, although with their own, their own distinctiveness because of geometry. Between this tree and this box, there is a difference, but they are united by the patina of the wood that covers the box. And so there is also a, a separation, but also a togetherness between the buildings and, 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 and nature. And the corner of the room, I think, is, uh, is formidable because always the corner of a room is, is problematic, it's a little bit difficult because that's where a wall meets another wall and it's, it's the, the, the conclusion in a way. How do you do it? So you still evoke a certain sense of freedom. He does it differently from Frank Lloyd Wright or even Le Corbusier. You know, I like the fact that the frame of the window, the frame of the glass is becoming furniture. You know, and also more uh, sculpturally interesting and it also uh, functions. He pro problematizes the corner and makes it more hybrid. In my opinion, more interesting is a very interesting uh, uh, interpretation what the corner of a room could be or should be. The Fisher, Fisher House by Louis Kahn. And here you see the, uh, you know, the two, you know, the two cubes, if I am to call them cubes. So there is strict geometry, but there is also playfulness. And even capriciousness. I think they are part of art. It's a great building. Now the Escherich house, different, a little different from the Fisher house. This one has no rotations, uh, but it's still uh, noble and uh, symmetrical and asymmetrical at the same time. Uh, the symmetry can be found in this part, but then here you have asymmetry. This is symmetrical, but all in all, so you have both the stability of symmetry and the instability, instability of asymmetry. Uh, Mario Botta inspired himself from Louis Kahn, but in my opinion, um, Kahn is a superior architect. Although Mario Botta did some interesting works himself. So uh, this is uh, the Escherich house. You see, the building is distinct from the landscape and from nature. It uses geometry, it uses axes, it uses, uh, you know, uh, straightforward walls. But the good architect is able to negotiate between the nature, between nature and the building, or between nature and geometry. And I think he, he was able. He shows this building says the human being has his or her own specificity. You know, it's, 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 it's other within nature, but it's still connected with nature. The Shapiro residence, here I don't have too many images, uh, but you see us, uh, you know, the connection with the first house that we looked at at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, the roof again, the ceiling is important, a sketch with the low resolution and another uh, image uh, of this house. I couldn't find too many images of this house. I don't know why. Now, um, this is a, a work that was uh, uh, built uh, after he died, um, the so-called ancient temple precinct in New York City. Uh, it's built four decades after Louis Kahn's death, New York City's Four Freedoms Park, the architect's posthumous memorial to Frank, Franklin D. Roosevelt. I know he, it was praised as being uh, his best work. In my opinion, it is not. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, it shows again that four decades, 40 years later, after he died, it was built. The, the impact of Louis Kahn was still felt. 
Although someone like Rem Kolkas, I've heard him saying never again Khan. I think Kolkas dislikes Louis Khan immensely, or so he did in the, in the 90s. Uh, some other pictures of this, uh, uh, you know, Freedom Park in New York with a portrait of uh, Roosevelt here. But that was not his proposal. That is independent of the architecture, although he maybe provided the locus for, for that, um, that sculpture to, to, to happen. Anyway, I, I don't find this work. The way it was uh, built, I, I feel that is, but maybe because I know it was not built uh, while Khan was alive. That is possible too. Here we see the, the United Nations building and far away the, the Empire State Building and so on. Unbuilt works. There is a book, a very nice book published with his unbuilt works, but so-called built digitally. Uh, I had this book, um, unbuilt works. So even if they are not built, they can be so-called built digitally. Uh, Palazzo dei Congressi in Venice, uh, it was not built, but the project was done. Uh, sketches, uh, the plan of the Congress Hall, a large, massive uh, building. Maybe it's good it was not built, I don't know. I don't know exactly where it would have been. But uh, Venice is fragile as it is. I don't know if it needs uh, a lot of monumentality. Now the Hurva Synagogue in Jerusalem, in Israel, which was not built and it could have been a great building, but was not built. A citadel, another citadel. The medieval uh, Louis Kahn uh, showed his uh, affection for uh, that type of sensibility too in this work. It's the citadel of the spirit, that's what it is. The plan is somehow similar with the Exeter Public Library, with the Exeter Library. We are approaching the end of the presentation. Very soon I will end. This was a long, quite a marathon today. So this is, uh, was proposed for Jerusalem in Israel. A memorial to the 6 million Jewish martyrs in New York, a project which was not built. pencil drawings on yellow tracing paper. They always move me, these uh, fragile uh, drawings. And this is the last image of this presentation. So Louis Kahn died in 1974 on the 17th of March. And today is the 17th of March in 2022. Thank you.